Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I would like to preach on the, the blood of Christ. And <clears throat> I was working on this a couple weeks ago and, and uh, stepped away from it for a while uh, while I was dealing with my mother's situation and whatnot. But I uh, came back to it and it was still a, an exciting thing. And I, I want to say at the outset, uh, a thought as, as we go through this about, about the blood of Christ, there, there's a, one of the things that the, the reformers and believers of the time past, the, one of the reasons they have called free will a heresy is that it makes light of the blood of Christ. It means that the blood of Christ, Christ's sacrifice didn't do the job. There was more that had to happen, and that's why uh, be, be, that's why they were so against that concept. And when you see these things tonight, and you see these passages, and I, I put them all out here. Normally, I don't put them all in there or, or search around, but they're all here. I just kind of want to go through and point out some things about them that you, you can see that this this blood of Christ is incredibly powerful, and not at all uh, uh, like we might think of our own sacrifice for something. You know, we, we might give our lives for our country or this or that, or the other thing, but we're giving, you know, our sacrifice is weak and it's imperfect. But this is this sacrifice is absolutely uncorruptible and perfect. And uh, first I want to establish this point. In Levit Leviticus 17.11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your soul. Speaking in the Old Testament about the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and such, uh, it's given upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. From Adam, uh, from Adam's transgression in the garden where God slayed the animal and covered them with the skins, you know, uh, you've got the same picture that, that, that transgression is covered by blood. That, 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 that absent blood well look at Hebrews 9.22 uh, almost all things are in, by the law are purged with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission so that begs the question what does it mean by remission so I, I looked this up in the uh, uh, my Greek uh, texts and so forth and I got excited about this because the, the word ephesus can, means release from imprisonment forgiveness and it comes from a root word meaning to send away to send away and 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 the picture there is that uh, you know your their sins are being sent away cast in the dip, depths of the sea it says in one passage and another passage it says uh, 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 it's as far as the east is from the west so this remission means it, it takes the sin of the sinner and it's thrown beyond a recovery it's thrown away and uh, so where it says, uh, uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. If there's no remission, those sins are still there. So this, this uh, blood is necessary to satisfy the Father, but it can't be any blood. It has to be the blood of a perfect sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, the picture of that was uh, when they were uh, at Passover, they were to, to set the sheep aside, and they were to watch them, and they were to look to, to, look to see if there was any blemish. Uh, and they would watch it for a week, just to see, at least a week, uh, and to see if there's any sort of defect at all in, the, in that sheep. Because if they would offer anything that was blemished or damaged or corrupted in some way, God would not accept it. And so the, the picture in the Old Testament, in type, if you will, of the Christ to come was there's going to be a sacrifice. That sacrifice must be absolutely perfect. And only that will satisfy God. In Acts 1043 with regard to this remission it says to him that's to Christ give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins that remission again that casting away or sending away our sins and in Acts 1339 you see the same concept by him all that believe are justified from all things from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So this, this uh, blood of Christ, first of all, to, to, to establish that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. 
remission is our uh, our need, uh, sins being cast away and his righteousness placed upon us, and that uh, whosoever believes in him, that's the Christ of Scripture, shall receive remission of sins. The second point I want to make is that this, and, and kind of putting this a little bit deeper, that this perfect blood, what, what do we mean by that? In 1 Peter 1 and 18 to 19, it says, For as much as you, you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So here we see the Christ of Scripture described without blemish, without spot. That word precious means priceless. There's nothing, you, there's, you, you cannot attain this. You know, I, I, there's nothing in the world that, you know, that, that we could give in exchange for this. It's, it's priceless. And it's, it's a, a lamb without blemish and without spot. <clears throat> if you are, if I die for you or you die for me, that's not going to satisfy God. Because I'm not, I'm corruptible. Uh, but his blood is spotless. So the third point I want to make is that, you know, just how I'll use a word for you, uh, for you kids, uh, efficacy or efficacious means it gets the job done. It works. So his blood is efficacious. It gets the job done. It justifies, cleanses, and redeems. Take a look at these verses. In Acts 2, 20, 28, it says this was uh, Paul speaking to uh, to the disciples and of the churches at that time, he said, "Take heed to yourselves and the, to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood." So, first of all, I want to establish what has this blood blood done. Number one, that blood has purchased believers. Uh, he's purchased the church with His own blood. Number one, in Romans five nine, it says. Uh, much more than being now justified by his blood will be saved from wrath to come uh, through him. So there's justification. Justification means, uh, uh, and Pastor Warner used to say, just as if I'd never sinned. Now there's a difference between an acquittal and a justification. Acquittal means I couldn't prove you're guilty, but I still think you are. Justified means not only are you not guilty, which is the way that we do it in America. It means, no, we have proven, we are saying, you are innocent. So when it says you're justified by his blood, it means you are made right before God. You are no longer, it's not that you're just not guilty, you're innocent. That's a very, very powerful thought. Look at Ephesians 1, 7. It says, speaking of Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We see it, see it again. That we're justified, we're redeemed, bought back to God. Bought back uh, in his mind in, in eternity, fallen in Adam, recovered by God. Uh, you know, that word redemption gets tossed around about, especially like by people like Jesse Jackson. They talk about redemption in terms that, you know, that make no sense really, but what redeeming means is just like a coupon. It means uh, it's going back to the original, to its original owner. So you have a coupon, but that coupon belongs to the company that's selling you something. So you take that coupon and you give it back to them. It's their coupon, not yours. And if you give it back to them, you get you get a discount on your can of beans or whatever. But redeemed means bought back. In the mind of God before eternity and eternity past, fallen in Adam, fallen to a state of complete hatred of God by nature, bought back by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 13, uh, 12, it says, Wherefore Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So we, there's sanctification or, uh, that's the, if you will, the imparting of his holiness onto the believer. Not only are our sins chased away as far as the east is from the west, we're made right before God. That's unfathomable, really, if you think about it, to say that I can stand before God and not, <laughs> as it says, and not perish, and not perish. <clears throat> in John 1, 7, it says, uh, we should walk in the light as he is in the light, have fellowship one with another. 
And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. We see it again, the same concept over and over again. And as I'm reading through these, you can think in your mind, gee, I, no wonder the reformers got so mad because if they're saying that Christ died for you, he, he poured out his blood on, on the mercy seat on behalf of you, and you still have to do something? I don't get it. Um, it says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In Revelations, it says uh, is, uh, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And then finally, uh, in Revelations, in 7.14, it says uh, John ask, asking the angel, Sir, you know, he, he said to me, speaking of these people that he saw in white robes, Says, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the righteousness of Christ in exchange for the sin of the sinner. All we've contributed to our all we contribute to our sin or to our salvation is sin. The fourth point I want to make then is that the blood changes one's mind about how God saves. And so how did, how does that work? Look at Hebrews 9, 14. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? This blood, this, uh, when, when, the, when God's spirit speaks to you about what this word is saying and about the Christ of Scripture, born of a virgin, living spotless life, completely pleasing to the Father without spot or without blemish dying in the behalf of, of wretched sinners that blood not only does it save us and, and uh, justify cleanse and redeem it purges the conscience the way we think from dead works we're no longer thinking I can add to this to have your mind purged from dead works you now say that blood is all that's needed <laughs> that'll get her done if I don't have that, I don't have anything. I don't. Because, but that's the work of Christ and, and the Spirit of God inside the believer to understand that that blood was altogether efficacious. It got the job done. And in your mind, you'll never think that your contribution, your prayer, your good deed, your baptism, your you name it, adds one wit to the work of God in saving a sinner. And your mind is purged of that by the blood of Christ. In Colossians it says, we've made peace, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, uh, I say, whether they be things in the earth or in things in heaven. But uh, our peace with God, having made peace, how? Through that blood on that cross. Peace is made between the sinner and God. And that blood gives access to God. This is when I get excited about this one. Hebrews, I get excited about all of these, but Hebrews 10, 9 says, We have, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We can have access to prayer. We have access to God Almighty, direct access to God Almighty by the blood of Christ, by the blood of Christ. So when you go in prayer, it says you can go boldly. You can go boldly because you know it's not you. It's not... You stand there made white, made clean by the blood of Christ. All that you are fades in the background, no effect, no impact, meaningless. But you're there because of the work of Christ, and you have boldness to enter in and to make your petition known before God, your supplication, your worship, your praise, everything in that holiest of holy, in the prayer, speaking to your God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God. And then finally in point six, uh, we won't return to our old thoughts of, uh, of self-aggrandizement. That's what I, what I mean by that, thinking we're more than what we are. In Hebrews 12, 11, it says, uh, these are believers, they overcame the devil and all that he has to offer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. That there are things that are more meaningful, uh, that uh, we overcome battles in this in our day, the battles that we face, 
battles in your life, whatever all, they may say, well, that's such a small battle. Not really. God doesn't think so. I don't care how small the issue is for you. God doesn't think it's small. If you don't think it's small, he doesn't think it's small. And overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, uh, that's, uh, that's praise to God. Uh, his work inside the believer, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a right thing. It's a good thing. So in conclusion, I, I, I want to go back over these things. It's that God requires blood for the atonement of sin. That blood must be perfect, pure, holy. Okay, not going to come from man. It's going to come from one born of a woman, but very God in, in the flesh. That's Jesus Christ. And this blood of Christ cleanses, washes from all sins. It, it, uh, it, it's the basis of the remissions of sin or the tossing of those sins as far into the sea that where they'll never be seen or heard of again. Uh, imagine standing before God and the accuser accusing of all the different things you've done. And it'll be a long list. And the Father says, I don't know what you're talking about. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Justifies, redeems, sanctifies. It's adequate in every respect. Efficacious, as they used to say, for the purchase of his people to eternal salvation. It purges the mind from hope that man adds anything to this. It, it, all glory to Christ, all glory to God. Salvation is of the Lord. And it's the root cause of our peace with God. It changes the way we think about it. And it empowers us to, to overcome the world by this faith imparted. And we have boldness. And this is so sweet and so special. They have boldness to pray and know that the Father hears. Not because of we've been a good today or because we've been the best, you know, we've been on our good behavior, but because Christ, who was perfect, did everything necessary to, to bring us to the Father. And that on the basis of his doing and dying, we can make our petitions, our praise, our supplications before God Almighty. So I hope you can understand now why the reformers were so upset about some notion that, yeah, if Jesus, uh, Jesus died for everybody, that meant that blood was shed for someone that's not going to heaven. That's absolutely, utterly impossible if these things about the blood are true. It's just, it's, it, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And either Scripture's right or they're right. And Scripture's right. So I'll close with Revelations 5, 9. Uh, in heaven, they're singing a new song. It says, speaking of the Lord Christ, thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people and nation. What a precious day that's going to be when believers gather together and thank their Lord for the work that he did in shedding and taking all the punishment of God for all believers for all time. And now they have that peace with God, that communion with God, which is utterly unspeakable uh, in, in terms of the joy it brings to the heart.